YouTubers are just regular people, catapulted into fame and fortune by their fans who appreciate their personalities. Because of that, they're willing to watch ads, buy merchandise, run fandom accounts, and more in the name of their online personality of choice. But what happens when the content creator accidentally makes himself popular with an audience of people they didn't intend to target? Or worse yet, what if they're not fit, mentally or otherwise, to have that audience? Today, we'll explore the complicated relationship between creators and their fame. Though nowadays he's known almost exclusively as Joji, before Japanese-Australian singer-songwriter George Miller made waves with his music, he was terrorizing the internet as his completely brand-unsafe alter ego, Filthy Frank. Beginning all the way back in 2011 with a simple and pretenseless upload titled Filthy Sh**. To say that Frank had one of the most successful and influential runs as a content creator is downplaying it. While edginess has been around forever on the internet, Frank was primarily held responsible for helping it crystallize on YouTube. Many people described what he was doing as bringing the kind of humor popular on the b-board of 4chan to a YouTube audience. Basically, if you were there in 2016, when people were regularly joking about ending their whole shit, you had one guy to thank. In many ways, he walked so that others could run. His earlier content consisted of a lot of yelling, <laughs> embarrassing himself in public, raps, and every kind of inappropriate ism known to man. His later content was all of those things but with more production value. In a way, being repelling in every way possible was so typical for Frank that it really stood out whenever he made content that was remotely palatable for mainstream audiences. It might surprise some to discover that he originated the Do the Harlem Shake meme in 2013. Regardless of how bad taste or indecent his humor got, every upload consistently racked up millions of views, so much the TV Filthy Frank, the channel that George operated for the brunt of his prime years now boasts a total of over 1 billion views. As followers of the content piled on in astounding numbers, a lot of unwanted attention came along with it. Namely, people that were either too obtuse or too young to see the channel and the content for what it was. Purely comedic. Partly because of this, it felt necessary for there to be a debrief and explanation in the channel's about section, which read, Filthy Frank is the embodiment of everything a person should not be. He is anti-PC, anti-social, and anti-couth. He behaves and reacts excessively to everything expressly to highlight the ridiculousness of racism, misogyny, legalism, injustice, ignorance, and other social blights. He also sets an example to show how easy it is in the social media for any zany material to gain traction slash followings by simply sharing unsavory opinions and joking about topics many find offensive. There is no denying that the show is terribly offensive, but this terrible offensiveness is a deliberate and unapologetic parody of the whole social media machine and a reflection of the human microcosm that social media is. Or maybe I'm just f***ing retarded. Despite this disclaimer seemingly softening the blow, the content itself remained pretty rough around the edges well into the late 2010s. Honestly, it's surprising it lasted as long as it did. Unlike many other instances where people dabble in offensive and sensitive topics and get banned for it, Frank left the platform of his own accord, much to the dismay of the extremely loyal following he had built up. While it initially puzzled a few of the watchers who didn't see it coming, the seeds for the disbandment of the filthy Frank identity had been sown a long time before the prospect of a professional music career was on George's horizon. In 2014, Frank released a now-deleted video to his old account, Disaster Music, called Filthy Frank Exposes Himself, where he appears as George, no character, and explains his reasons for why the content slowed down. So I'm gonna be straight up with you guys. Uh, I have not been well the last couple months. Long story short, I was born with this, but I was recently diagnosed with a brain condition um, that, ironically, uh, gives me seizures. You know, I, this whole time, we thought it was so funny doing these fake seizures, and now, uh, some call it bad luck, some call it karma, but ironically, uh, boss. Hey boss, I have a seizure. Besides juggling the show with his college assignments and even jobs, he reveals he'd also been struggling with a neurological problem that caused him to have stress-induced seizures. In the same video, he mentions that some of his viewers might get upset that he broke the fourth wall to inform them of his health concerns, once again signaling a potential divide between him and his fan base. Years later, in an exchange he had on his personal Twitter account, George says, So I act out some cringe shit upload, bounce. Same old cycle for now. Admittedly, some are passion projects forced through the FF character. When asked by his fans if he loved what he did, he said, it doesn't really matter. That's how the world is, hun. It's just a big ball of poop, and you will find out sooner or later. This despondent attitude about the content was a bit of a shock to the fans who cherished it. At this point, he was already laying the groundwork to bridge the Filthy Frank show and his interest in making music, mainly through Pink Guy's music projects, which were becoming bigger and more ambitious. This transition also coincided with YouTube's first 
first Adpocalypse, and as you can imagine, it wasn't looking good for his channel, considering the caliber of content it was chock full of. Not only that, but the cultural climate was rapidly shifting from one that was okay with edgier content to one that saw it as the potential promotion of bigotry and prejudice, which, again, the channel was rife with, albeit in a comedic context. These tweets preceded the actual end of the show by a whole two years. It was only in 2018 that the cost of being filthy frank became too much to afford, given that the benefits were steadily declining and on their way to being non-existent. Along with a video officially declaring it to be over, George tweeted an explanation that read, I believe an official statement as to why I'm now done with comedy is owed to my former fan base, of which I'm extremely grateful for. And while it genuinely pains me to express this, I do hope that the reasons below may provide some insight into my decision. Unfortunately, I no longer enjoy producing that content. Several serious health concerns, including but not limited to throat tissue damage and neurological conditions that I prefer not to get into. This decision is final. I really can't express just how grateful I am to all of you, nor will I ever forget the relationship that we had together. Moving forward, it is up to you whether you'd like to join or not. In any event, I will strive to continue creating and developing projects I'm passionate about and hope you'll succeed in doing the same. In another post, he said, At the end of the day, I'd like you to know that I'm truly sorry for disappointing you. I do want to clarify that tending to severe health issues does not equate to abandonment. Please do not internalize the repercussions of my health issues. I'm not following dreams here. I am following neurologist order. This is about livelihood. I only want to live a long, happy, and healthy life, and I pray that each of you are able to do the same. Despite how career-endingly controversial his run as Filthy Frank was, George managed to launch his music career into the stratosphere with ease. Partly, this was because of how clean-cut his departure from the Filthy Frank brand was, but also because a substantial amount of Frank fans already wanted him to focus on the Joji projects, even if they came at the behest of the end of Frank. Since his shift into exclusively working on music, he's published three studio albums and accrued over a billion views on YouTube. A pretty impressive feat if I may say so myself. But despite how well-received Joji was by his original fanbase, some newcomers who were just stumbling into his music for the first time were shocked to find out what George was up to before becoming a musician. In particular, the K-pop stan communities on Twitter were mortified upon discovering the existence of Filthy Frank, which begat the 2020 hashtag Joji is over party. Unbeknownst to them, most people online who followed George's music releases knew about Frank and were Frank fans before they were Joji fans. This fact didn't stop the K-pop stans from wigging out and acting as if uncovering his problematic past would result in his downfall. Of course, that's not what happened. In fact, nobody cared about their takes as usual, but an attempt was made. Fortunately for him, this campaign failed in such a humiliating fashion that it became a meme, which later discouraged people from trying at all. Ultimately, this worked out in George's favor. It's also worth noting that in recent months, YouTube themselves have begun removing some of his more offensive uploads, such as the Cake Trilogy, which are now only available through fan re-uploads on YouTube. While it has been widely speculated that George resents his fame as Filthy Frank, or has tried to part ways with it entirely due to fear of being cancelled, there have been multiple instances of him referencing his old persona in jest at concerts, usually promoted by an audience member in a pink eye costume costume, or when the crowd begins chanting Filthy Frank, to which he replies by saying they're people of culture. <laughs> Add this to the fact that he stayed friends with Max Mofo and Chad, anything for views, after transitioning into his music career as Joji, and it seems clear that, on some level, George has made peace with it and embraced the fact that, for many of his fans, he is and will always be Filthy Frank, and there's nothing embarrassing about that. Despite the internet's infamous penchant for anonymity, most content creators, even the ones that start anonymously, eventually cave into the pressure and sacrifice their privacy to either satisfy a demanding audience or attract one. Achieving widespread success online is difficult if you aren't willing to allow the public to peer into your personal life and develop a parasocial relationship with you. However, if you can balance giving the viewers just enough of you so that they crave more, but not so much that they're either sick of you or constantly violate your privacy so you get sick of them, you can capture people's imagination in a very specific way. For a while, this sweet spot was hit by Corpse Husband. Known for his deep, distinctive voice and enthralling storytelling, this enigmatic figure has risen to stardom without ever revealing his true identity. With a massive following on YouTube and Twitter, Twitter, Corpse Husband's horror story narrations initially enthralled audiences and captivated a dedicated fan base. The qualities of his content aside, one of the most effective elements of his persona was the aura of mystery surrounding him due to his unwavering commitment to complete anonymity, deliberately shrouding his face and personal details. I was setting up to do a little bit of gaming when I noticed I had an alert from one of my net friends saying they had stumbled across something interesting. A series of black boxes that when opened, seemed to lead you down another web directory. 
It was like tunneling, but more vast. This decision has undoubtedly added to his allure, igniting curiosity and fascination among his fans. By keeping his identity out of reach instead of plastering it all over every video of his, as the average YouTuber tends to do, Corpse Husband dangled the enigma of who he was and how he looked in front of the viewer's face. While his unique voice and the stories he told were more than sufficient to captivate the watchers, Corpse Husband himself became the focus of attention over time. This is a bit of a backfire since part of the reason for the concern with anonymity was that it allowed people to pay attention to the stories and judge the content on its merit instead of developing a cult of personality and fandom. His popularity was kicked into high gear as he slowly but surely transitioned into the music industry. In 2016, he was featured in a Living Tombstone song called Grim Grinning Ghost, which currently sits at almost 5 million views. While this proved that Corpse had a reason to believe this endeavor was promising, it was only a fraction of the success that he went on to achieve through music. In 2020, he dropped the hit single White Tea, which has over 26 million views. While this is already extremely impressive at face value for someone in such an unorthodox starting position to become a recording artist, Corpse went on to surpass it a few months later when he dropped E-Girls Are Ruining My Life, which more than doubled the number of views of his first single, with over 55 million views. Within a year, he was featured on a song with an established artist, Machine Gun Kelly, which garnered over 28 million views. It seemed everywhere he showed up, the numbers just piled on relentlessly. But as you can imagine, attracting a lot of attention online goes both ways, and with all the positive feedback came many hardships, both in his personal life behind the scenes and online. Often, when you seek to not draw attention to yourself, you accidentally attract even more attention, which was very much the case with Corp's husband. One of the reasons for people's infatuation with his identity, particularly his appearance, was his voice. Before I start the video, I just wanted to give a quick thank you to Felix, aka PewDiePie. The recent growth on my channel, and in general on everything else, was initially caused by him being kind and welcoming enough to allow me on his channel, which I'm incredibly grateful for. He's done things to help me that he definitely didn't have to do, and even behind the scenes has just been super nice. Some people thought he was faking it or using a voice changer, others speculated that his face wouldn't match his voice. Honestly, there were a lot of e-girls who idealized him as some handsome anime stud, and consequently, a lot of dudes who were rooting for the day their fanfic fantasies got crushed, and Corpse was revealed to be an extremely unattractive dude. Neither of these expectations would be met in reality. Whether because they liked him obsessively, or hated him blindly, people became fixated on Corpse and tried to pry personal information out of him in any way they could. If having one stalker is already bad news, imagine being gang stalked by however many thousands of people were scouring through his online presence to find one moment where he slipped up and revealed something about himself. As far as stalking goes, he'd already dealt with a serious incident in real life. Back in 2016, someone knocked on his house's door and claimed to be from a gas company. His mom was the one who opened the door, and since she had no reason to doubt this person's claims, she let them in. Only later, when they called the gas company, they decided discovered they had no involvement in that visit. In the following days, there were multiple occasions where cars parked outside the house that sped off when someone left the house to check, and even one instance of someone trying to kick in the door. Mind you, this was years before the astronomical degrees of online fame he would accumulate, so imagine how much worse it could be in present day. As his audience grew, having an online presence became a lot more costly and stressful, and impossible to engage with in a healthy way. Sure, he was looking for it, in a way, but he couldn't have known that's how it would pan out. But that was far from Corpse's only struggle. Corpse was already battling multiple physical ailments, namely fibromyalgia, a condition that causes a plethora of issues such as generalized pains, sleep issues, and fatigue. He also had thoracic outlet syndrome, which is when your rib cage is compressing the nerves on your chest, as well as sleep apnea, chronic insomnia, an eye condition that caused him to have to wear an eye patch, and last but not least, he had GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, meaning stomach acid kept flowing back into his esophagus and constantly irritating it, which caused his voice to be as deep as it was. Years ago, I thought it was fibromyalgia, but at the time, doctors weren't believing me because I was 19, in shape, seemingly okay, uh, but then the problems started getting worse, and it started with my eyesight. I wasn't able to read stories because uh, my eyesight was going. Whenever I would get checked for a prescription, they would tell me I have 20-20, but then I wouldn't be able to see what I'm reading. These problems were compounded by the mental illnesses he developed due to his online presence, such as imposter syndrome and anxiety. Overall, the stress of being corpse was already getting to be a bit much for him. In his song, Agoraphobia, he mentions he fears going outside because he fears people will find him. Recognizing how taxing maintaining all of his online projects was to him, corpse slowed down posting content on his horror channel, which was hitting record numbers through his Among Us videos, so that he could focus more on his music. In February 20. 
2021, Corpse revealed that the stress from doing the Among Us streams took such a toll on his mental health that he cut his face with a razor blade 10 minutes before starting a stream to deal with his anxiety because of his insecurity about his appearance. When asked about a potential face reveal, he said, Realistically, it will happen, inevitably against my will. But a lot of people think it's a business thing or a gimmick. I just deeply fucking hate my face, and people's expectations at this point are ridiculous and unachievable. Naturally, this was cause for concern for the fans who genuinely cared about his well-being and went out of their way to show him some support. For the better part of a year, his uploading was very infrequent on both channels, which worked towards achieving his goal of taking a step away from the limelight, though only to a limited extent, since whenever he did put something up, it soared to millions of views almost instantly. Unfortunately, obsessive fans and haters alike don't forget a target, nor do they give up easily, and while he tried to hang back and heal, they worked in silence, culminating in September of 2021 with his alleged face reveal. Apparently, people found a picture of Corpse from when he must have been a teenager by figuring out his grandmother's Facebook account. As he expected, Twitter users in droves complained about his appearance not meeting their standards. Don't you hate it when real life people don't look like the anime characters you imagine them to be? Meanwhile, others brought up the possibility that the face reveal might not even be Corpse at all, and just some random emo looking teenager that was now being mocked by the entire internet. Corpse never commented on the situation itself, and it's dubious whether the person in the picture is him or not. To make matters worse, the reveal was promptly followed by another dox, this time not only of what he looks like, even if from a distance, but of where he lives, what gym he attends, and his full name. Again, no comment was made on these leaks either, and to this day, very little is known about Corpse besides what he decides to share with his audience voluntarily. One thing is for sure though, with this horrific track record, he has all the motivation to continue to fly under the radar, since some people are downright repulsive when it comes to respecting the privacy of others. Sky Does Minecraft, also known as Adam Dahlberg, was one of the original Minecraft Blitz players from the early 2010s. Because of how entertaining and energetic his gameplays were, there was a point in time when he held a position next to other gaming giants from the early 2010s. At one point in time, he was even the single most subscribed Minecraft channel with over 12 million, behind only PewDiePie. His Butter series, where he notoriously referred to gold as butter in the game, spawned a catchphrase that became synonymous with his brand and fan base. The only issue with that is, given how wide-ranging his audience was, especially among younger viewers, inside jokes quickly go from funny and community-oriented to annoying and forced on outsiders. To put it bluntly, the kids in his audience took the butter thing along with his hatred for squids in Minecraft and turned it into a dogma they proselytized everywhere they went. Mainly, this meant Minecraft servers getting griefed and masked by players leaving behind signs that declared war on squids or labeled gold as butter, as well as spamming every chat until they got banned or muted. The unintended consequence of the misled fans who did this was that people associated associated the actions of the fan base with Sky himself, and preemptively disliked him because of that. At this point, being a famous online gamer was still in its early stages as a concept, so this situation served as a case study of what can happen when a fandom grows too enthusiastic. Surprisingly, he managed to deal with it well for half a decade. Not only did his conventional Minecraft content flourish, but he successfully branched out into other endeavors, such as music. Even if it was still centered around Minecraft, 89 million views is nothing to sneeze at, especially considering how much of a cultural staple of nostalgia these kinds of songs eventually became to those who grew up watching the YouTubers from this era. Right around the same time his online popularity was peaking, his personal life was also reaching its zenith, as in 2015, he married his girlfriend Alessa, with whom he had a child, Mason. Initially, this marked a change for the better in his life, as they decided to no longer curse on the videos so that kids, including their son, could watch them. It was an endearing arc, from being a silly gamer to a family man, and the fans appreciated the parts of their life he chose to share with them. However, However, this period of grace didn't last very long. Within the next two years, Sky's following went from delighted in how wholesome his story was to closely watching Sky and Alessa's relationship fall apart, supposedly after multiple instances of her cheating on him. At least that's how the story was told. Sky does Minecraft, a YouTuber with over 11 million subscribers, went fucking off on Twitter last night because his fiance, the mother, to his kid had been cheating on him. It all started with Sky quoting one of her tweets which said, I wish I never met you and I wish everyone knew what a horrible person you are behind your mask you fucking enjoy wearing so much. He followed this up with, in before the, oh my God, don't make it public. You made it public when you started fucking around with so many of my fucking public YouTube friends. Garbage. Like seriously, how fucking many people was enough, woman? You'd think be able to count it on one hand would be enough. 
Going through a breakup is bad. Going through a divorce that involves a child is infinitely worse. But doing it all in front of an audience of possibly millions of bystanders is the kind of thing you'll only find on YouTube and in the inner circles of hell. At the time, most people sided with Sky, especially since during the divorce proceedings, Sky was given custody of Mason, solidifying his position that Alessa was the one in the wrong. Now, it's impossible to accurately tell to what extent each party contributed to the divorce, but one thing is certain, Sky was not the squeaky clean good guy he was widely thought to be when this was happening. In 2017, Sky quit gaming to focus on his music career, and as has been deduced by the people who were paying close attention to his online presence, entered into a relationship with a girl called Elizabeth. This, along with many of Sky's dark secrets he hid from his fanbase, was hinted at in KSI's diss track to him, Adam's Apple. I can't stress enough how much of a late 2010s internet moment this was. Sky's serious abuse allegations, which would eventually undo the rest of his career as an entertainer, were first mentioned in a KSI diss from 2017. Worst of all, people sided with Sky at the time because the information KSI was referencing was coming from Alessa, who everyone thought to be an untrustworthy cheater slandering Sky to get Mason's custody back. And on top of that, I mean it was a diss track after all. It was only at the beginning of 2022 that more was disclosed when Elizabeth came forward and backed Alyssa up. In the document shared by Elizabeth, she said, You are a sick man. I spent months and months loving you with my whole entire being. I spent thousands of dollars just to come live with you. You made promises you didn't want to keep, but promises you made to manipulate my life so you could be in control. You use your fame, your name, and your platform to hide the disgusting and disgraceful things that you so claim not to do. You not only verbally abused and degraded me, the mother of your second child, you traumatized me and put me through things no one should ever have to experience. You hurt me for too long, and I'm tired of feeling afraid of you and what speaking up may bring. I had to tell people you weren't abusive, because whenever I said you were, you would harass me and say horrible, horrible things. You were so unkind. I do not wish for anybody to have mental health struggles, nor do I wish for somebody, even you, to have such severe struggles. I wanted nothing but to love you and help you heal. You informed me you were only bipolar and possibly on the spectrum, which was never a problem for me. That was not the case. What you hid from me is the dangerous man you were capable of being, the person you are overall. 95% of our relationship, you hid me. You refused to want people to know my name or know about me at all. You avoided it at all costs, saying it was to protect the relationship. You refused to even let me talk about the baby publicly, as if it was irrelevant and you didn't care. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. According to Elizabeth, he consistently pressured her into pregnancy, despite her saying she wasn't ready for a baby. However, when she did get pregnant, Sky seemed unfazed and did next to nothing to help out, effectively being an absent father before the baby was even born. Additionally, the cheating accusations he levied at Alessa started looking like projection, since Elizabeth described him as being very shifty with his online messaging, using multiple different apps, and deleting and hiding messages to prevent her from seeing what he was doing on his phone all the time. Another red flag about his infidelity was that he repeatedly tried to convince Elizabeth to open their relationship into polyamory. Of course, this was because he was already cheating on her. What aggravated this habit of Skye's was that he never asked for the ages of the girls he engaged in conversation with and even sent nudes to. Honestly, there's no downplaying the sheer volume of insanity in these accusations, with the worst of which being making multiple death threats to and physically hurting Elizabeth by elbowing her in the stomach, and stealing money from companies to buy drugs, which Elizabeth had to pay back out of her own pocket. He also had the habit of randomly spamming and harassing people online late at night during one of his psychotic drug binges, and purposely clogging the toilet <laughs> so that Elizabeth would have to go to a nearby gas station in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. Okay, now that one is just freaking epic. Eventually, the police became involved and helped Elizabeth out of her unfortunate situation, but not before she began to self-harm as a consequence of Sky's abuse. A lot of this, if not all of it, was happening while Elizabeth was pregnant, aggravating it to another level. After Elizabeth came out with her story, many other people felt emboldened to do the same and reveal their experiences working for Sky, all gruesome in their own way. Everything he had built in years of being a content creator, he lost in just a couple of years of not just recklessness, but an outright penchant for destroying himself and everyone around him in the most vicious way possible. He never addressed any of these claims besides the odd cryptic tweet where he suggested he would do something to hurt himself to get people sympathy. His fan base, which used to be exceptionally loyal, became desolate at the thought of the person he turned out to be. Whoever Sky was before he was a rich web celebrity was long gone, and his original fan base has no interest in holding out for his return. 
Noah Antweiler, widely known by his online moniker Spoonie, emerged as a prominent internet personality renowned for his video game reviews, let's plays, and comedic commentary. During his run as an active content creator, he fell into the same category as old John Tron, angry video game nerd, and nostalgia critic. It's understated how effective this format used to be, but media criticism interspersed with in-character skits during the late 2000s and early 2010s is what Twitch streamers reacting to videos and not saying anything is to modern day. But even from the beginning, there were signs that Spoonie was unfit for the degree of attention he was attracting. In 2010, he faced his first bout of criticism for his behavior at gaming conventions, namely E3. During a panel with Angry Joe, he started going off on a game called The Bureau, XCOM Declassified, for being too great a departure from the series' original format, yelling out betrayal repeatedly as he ranted. Given this was a very mild offense, but people picked up on his lack of self-awareness and how childish he tended to sound, almost as if he thought he was in character in one of his video sketches. This was just one of many instances where his contemporaries frowned upon his attitude, ultimately leading him to become a persona non grata in gaming convention circles. On the 11th of May 2012, Spoonie tweeted the following at a fellow member of Channel Awesome. You know, if things don't work out with you and at Nash 076, I'd be happy to chain you to a pipe in my basement and love you. My way. My way of loving someone is dirty and painful and ends in tears. As you can probably imagine, it didn't take very long for this tweet to get him in hot water. Though he did eventually apologize profusely for the tweet, his absolute tone deaf was noticed and considered a major liability for other people who were associating with him professionally. An example is when another member of Channel Awesome, Lord Cat, claims to have lost an interview with Minecraft creator Notch because of Channel Awesome's depreciated reputation as a result of Noah's online behavior. The whole gaming industry turned its back on me. Not you, not Joe, not blistered thumbs, me. I went to GDC the following year, Spoonie, and I had a chance to interview Notch Mojang, specifications, Minecraft. He was hot then. That was going to be huge for this week in games. That was going to be huge for the stream. It was going to be amazing. And you know what happened? The representative at Mojang caught wind that we were going to interview Notch. And he stepped in. And he said, oh, I've heard of you. You're with that guy with the glasses. You're with Blister Thumbs. And I tried to tell them, no, I'm not. But he said my name was associated with them. And he heard what you did. Making a fucking jackass of yourself at E3. You fucking moron. As a punitive measure, he was first suspended from posting to Channel Awesome for a month. And later on, let go of the network altogether. Instead of taking this as a note to be more careful about what he said and did, he took the opportunity to completely sh** on Channel Awesome, saying their site was poorly designed, and he left because he didn't need them anymore and could do better on his own. I guess the first thing I would talk about is there, there's kind of a financial aspect to this, and, and in many ways, I just didn't need Channel Awesome anymore, in the sense that it was a really one-sided relationship, but also on another respect, their website uh, is so poorly designed, it really is at atrocious. My videos are so buried beneath a nest of you know, layered, rooted menus that if you wanted to find my stuff, I think I'm under like blistered thumbs, side critics, and like, I'm so far buried, you can't see what I'm doing. And I'm one of the more popular guys on that side, or I was. Even if this were true to any extent, that's obviously not how you handle a situation, and what is essentially the closest thing you have to an actual career. In the same breath that he epically owned Channel Awesome, he admitted to not actually being sorry for the tweet that got him in trouble in the first place. This marked him as permanently unpredictable and prone to making bad decisions without considering the consequences. Quickly, this was associated with Spoonie's status in real life. He was an unemployed guy in his late 20s who admitted to having multiple psychological problems. Another sign that he wasn't dealing well with being an online entertainer was the frequency with which he engaged with negative feedback, as well as how he engaged with it, often banning people from his website if they dared to say something mean about his videos. Sure, it's his right to moderate his website however he wants, but a surefire way to tell someone is a narcissist is if they obsessively keep track of every single thing people say about them and try to silence criticism. Of course, the more he complained and interacted with the people saying abjectly negative things about him, the more people would do that just to spite him since they knew it would always get a reaction. Such is the nature of the internet after all. But you can't expect a guy who held a contest in which the prize was an autographed picture of himself to be capable of dealing with trolls in a moderately mature fashion. You see, Spoonie wasn't content in being a content creator. He idealized himself as an actor and comedian, which eventually culminated in the solidification of the infamous Spoonie movie. Despite the bad rep he had accrued in his already sparse upload schedule screeching to a halt after his departure from Channel Awesome, 
awesome, he was still a known entity in gaming circles and held in some regard by other content creators. Despite his tunnel vision on the hate he got, many people still really liked him and his content. Proof of which is that within six months of opening his Patreon page, he had over 500 supporters and was making almost $5,000 a month. He was being paid that much to produce $0 budget videos of him yapping about any media he wanted. Let it sink in just how much of a blessed position that really is. Eventually, his Patreon reached his highest goal, five grand, which would kick off the production of the Spoonie movie. At least, that's what the rewards on the Patreon said. When he announced he would begin working on the film, it was clear that he had no idea what he was getting into. Hey guys, bunch of big news lately. I haven't had a chance to report on it till now because I was out of state. But um, I guess the big news is somehow you guys have reached the uh, the Patreon goal where uh, it was listed that I would start work on a movie. I was blown away by this. You guys are the best fans in the world. Oh my God. It was just astonishing. Oh my God. But uh, that's part of what I wanted to talk to you about was uh, the plan, uh, the current status of things. The plan is, um, as a consequence, his own fans began pointing it out. After all, they were paying because they liked the reviews, not because they wanted a movie. The decision to make a movie was much more about Spoonie's fantasy about being an actor than responding to any popular demand. Another common criticism levied at Spoonie was that, despite him making more money than he'd ever made before, the quality of the content was steadily decreasing. But these criticisms were often silenced as Spoonie disabled the comments and ratings on any video they showed up on. This behavior, paired with his straight-up non-existent upload schedule, sapped the momentum he had built up on his Patreon, and within a year, he was getting $2,500, only half of what he was making before. He became increasingly inactive on all fronts, except Twitter, which he frequently updated with his usual ranting and raving. His hyperactivity on the platform reached critical mass with the election cycle, after which he spent six months without uploading any content, while his Patreon plummeted to just $600. In July, he made a series of tweets saying, Having a panic attack. I have so many things to do, so many number one priorities. All I can think to do is hide in bed. Every time I do, I'm afraid that for some reason this time I just won't wake up. I just can't face the goddamn camera for some reason. I've been down here for months trying to get my head straight, and I can't. Financially, this became an emergency six months ago, so I haven't been lacking for motivation. No idea what I'm going to do. I haven't given up, I never gave up, but I haven't gotten anywhere either. Replying to someone, he claimed that he was out of money and was going to lose his house. While this cannot be verified, it would make sense considering he showed no signs of being employed in any other way besides his Patreon, which he continued to update for the rest of 2017. It's not even necessary to say that the movie never materialized, despite being used as an excuse for the lack of regular Spoonie content. Even his most arduous fans were struggling with still supporting him at this point. Spoonie was now in his late 30s, and his mental issues were getting the best of him. He was suspended from Twitter for suggesting he would kill himself and take others with him, though his account has since been reinstated. The bank foreclosed his house, his girlfriend left him, and just recently, his dog Oreo passed away. Though since 2022, there have been things that suggest Noah might eventually make a comeback and do reviews, his story stands out as one of the most tragic meltdowns of a content creator. During the mid-2010s, when edgy content wasn't only surviving, but thriving on every online platform, Ian Washburn, or iDubs, emerged as a prominent figure, and in a way, the de facto leader of this era and genre of content. After years of diligently putting in work doing episodes on his series Kickstarter crap, wherein he reviewed poorly put together or outright deceptive Kickstarter projects, Ian developed two things, a small but respectable fanbase, and a very articulate capacity for criticism. He turned his fanbase into content by doing bad unboxing, which often ended in him being buried underneath sex toys and copies of Mein Kampf. With his critical sense, he made Content Cop, a series hailed for its unrelenting and brutal takedowns of other YouTube personalities that iDubs disapproved of. What stood out was his no-holds-barred attitude towards what he was willing to do in order to effectively prove a point. From attending Tana Mojo's event only to tell her to say the gamer word when they were taking a selfie, to shaving only the front of his head to demonstrate he wasn't insecure about his hairline on the Leafy is Here content deputy. He seemed invincible, immune to the hangups that would make pretty much any other person crawl into a fetal position and cry. On a platform where drama videos abound into endless back and forth with no clear winner, it was a sight for sore eyes when a new content cop appeared in the recommended, since with those, you always knew you would get what you subscribed for. But besides his own content, he also made illustrious appearances in other people's channels, most notably the Notorious Cake Trilogy from Filthy Frank. You really cannot understate how monumental these videos were during this era. It's a, you had to be there kind of thing. But with peaks so high, how could he ever follow it up? That's the question iDubs had been trying to answer for years. While Kickstarter 
starter crap and constant cop were discontinued entirely, the bad unboxing series lingered on for a while, though it took on increasingly strange formats. Besides the odd episode of iDubs Complains and the videos where he saved squirrels on a second channel, it seemed like he was genuinely at a loss as to what direction he would go with his content. Consequently, the uploads were far apart, and when they did come, they seemed underwhelming. But in 2019, Ian struck gold once again with his documentary on Airsoft Fatty, full force. Though it did numbers, it didn't have the cultural impact his past works had. While most of the feedback was largely positive, an undercurrent of iDubs fans began wondering where the edge he had went. Why did these new uploads feel oddly lukewarm? Eventually, this weird vibe some of his fans were getting from the content was made manifest when iDubs' then-girlfriend, Anissa, started an OnlyFans account. Many people felt that Ian's tolerance of this greatly betrayed his critical character. Though he'd never given his opinion on that specific topic, people presumed he wouldn't be the kind of guy who was okay with his girlfriend exposing herself in that way. While Ian harped on how ridiculous it was that people felt a parasocial connection to him and even looked up to him, his demeanor felt distinctly different, like he was more emotionally aggravated about this topic than he'd ever been about almost anything he covered on his channel. The conclusion drawn from this debacle was that the rift between Ian and his fan base was always there, and the conflict surrounding Anissa's OnlyFans just revealed it. Other people speculated that Anissa was affecting his opinions and softening his stance. Some even argued that Anissa's OnlyFans was a sign of her issues with self-esteem, and that Ian's tolerance of it was effectively enabling her. Ultimately, the only certain thing you can say about this controversy is that it marked a major shift in people's view of iDubs. A lot of people felt very alienated, and tied it to the noticeably milder content he'd been putting out. After all, when someone spends over half a decade being the most offensive person imaginable, it's a very radical change in pace when he starts making videos complaining about the amount of peanuts that come in peanut products. His content was still doing well, but it felt more like a regular YouTuber stuff as opposed to the headliner he once was. His personal views were once again the topic of discussion when at the end of 2020, he made a video lambasting anti-maskers. Regardless of what he thought on the matter, the fact that he would go out of his way to make a video about them was seen as a gratuitous virtue signal and perhaps a way to cut contrarian or right-wing viewers that he no longer wanted in his fan base out. A year later in 2021, some of his public perception would be restored with the dawn of Creator Clash, a boxing event that came together as a consequence of his yearning to fight rice gum, the final target of the Content Cop series. More importantly, Ian uploaded another documentary video, this time on comedian Sam Hyde. The video made waves since for years, no one with a significant mainstream presence interacted with Sam after the cancellation of his adult swim show World Peace due to political controversies. It also made people question just how loyal Ian was to his more progressive sensibilities, since he was essentially giving the time of day to someone who donated thousands of dollars to the Daily Stormer, an openly anti-Semitic and far-right website. Strangely, it seems Ian himself believed Sam's more offensive or risque jokes weren't ironic at all. The reception to the documentary was mixed. For some who were fans of both Sam and Ian, seeing them interact at all was amazing. Others picked up on how oddly passive-aggressive Ian behaved at times. Devout Sam fans felt it was a hit piece designed to show that he had fallen off. It also came off as strange that he decided to make some of his criticisms towards Sam's style of humor in post, instead of bringing most of it up directly to him while he shot the documentary. Ultimately, doing the doc on Sam was Ian's worst mistake. Not only did it immediately capture the attention of all the people he wanted to push away, but Sam himself was catapulted back into the internet's mainstream. While Sam himself wasn't allowed to fight at Creator Clash, he did train Harley Morenstein, one of the participants, who actually went on to win his fight. This became a complete nightmare once Creator Clash 2 rolled around. Froggy Fresh, another YouTuber slated to participate in the event, began associating with Sam Hyde. This, in addition to some remarks Ian considered offensive and unbecoming of the event's more brand-safe image, led him to drop Froggy from the event, which resulted in another controversy. People thought it was unfair that Froggy was dropped on such short notice after training for the fight. To make matters worse, Froggy was supposed to fight Chris Raygun, both of which are pretty short guys, and when Froggy was dropped, his replacement was significantly taller and with a much longer reach, resulting in a very visibly mismatched fight. Ian and Anissa, who organized the event, caught a lot of flack for this, which was accelerated by Sam's active participation in insulting and joking about their professional and personal decisions. Finally, this culminated in iDubs posting a video called I Miss the Old iDubs, where he explicitly disavows his old videos and what he considers his own bigotry and pledges to donate to progressive causes, such as the Trans Women of Color Collective. If I'm going to have the balls to go to Tana's uh, fan meetup and say slurs at her and then make a video about how it's okay to say slurs, I, I think I should have the balls to make an apology video and 
take accountability for the mistakes I've made. That's what this video is. I am responsible for creating a lot of hurtful and damaging content on this channel. And I've also created a culture of apathy and I don't know, a lot of like cruelty as well. Once again, people felt betrayed since in this video, he implies that the people he did content cops on didn't deserve it or that it was in poor taste or too offensive, which was largely why people found him funny in the first place. Others felt that regardless of his change of heart and personal beliefs on what kind of humor crosses the line, the video was gratuitously self-flagellating for something that virtually no one held against him. The way he talks about this content makes it sound like he used to fucking murder puppies for these videos. It, it was never that extreme. I very much would consider it edgy. It was 2016 edginess in all of its glory. And for its time, it lived peacefully. You know, all four nations, water, earth, fire, air, lived together in harmony with all this edginess going on. But I don't think think it was a mistake that he made those videos. They're not hurtful, nor do I really think they're damaging. There's been no significant criticism of content cops and their level of edginess since they came out, other than from Ian himself. There's no telling where Ian's struggle with the chasm between him and his audience will go next, but it shows how easily a creator can develop a fan base that consists of people they actually don't agree with or like. I've been Turkey Tom, thanks for watching, and until next time, leave me alone.